Thank you. Um, there are some snacks in the hallway. Just help yourself. It's a very casual atmosphere that we have. And on behalf of the chamber, I'd like to thank all of you for being here this morning. Uh, we uh, hold these sessions about twice a year. It seems like we were just here in January, and now here it is March 2nd. So thank you all for being here. If you have questions, there are paper and pen at the end of the row. Please write your question down. We'll collect those later, and I will read those, and then we'll, we'll see how that goes. Um, I think we're ready. Uh, I'd like to introduce then our state representative, Shane Lindar. Shane, we're going to use one microphone today. It picks up better for the TV station. And then um, we'll just see. You may have to handle all the, the uh, presentation and the questions. And then we'll see if Mark shows up. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, as Nancy said, I just want to thank you all for being here today. Um, I, I think I say this every time, but I know there's a lot of other things that you could be doing and, and taking your time out of the day to, to come and participate in this is, is uh, not insignificant. So thank you all for being here. Thank uh, Nancy uh, and the chamber for putting it on. Uh, I know that's a lot of behind the scenes work that you know a, a, lot, of, a lot of times we don't get to see. And, and of course, uh, UJC for always allowing us to use this space. So um, certainly appreciate that. Appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all. So um, just a kind of a brief, overview, a recap of, of session so far. Uh, we are scheduled to go to, uh, until the 15th of um, March here. We are hoping to get done this coming week, um, if all goes well. Um, I know there's a lot of other people that probably want us done as, as well. So uh, we're, we're hoping to get done and get out this week. We may may go um, into Friday or Saturday. Typically, we're done on a on a Thursday. But I think our speaker and, and um, uh, uh, President Pro Tem um, uh, is also interested in, in pushing this along. So we're, we may be done this week, but uh, thus far there were 112 bills that passed out of the House, uh, 110 out of the Senate. And so now for those of you who um, may or may not know, uh, once they pass out of the House, the process starts all over. They go to the Senate uh, and they got to go through the committee process and, and, and that as well. So uh, we'll kind of see how things shake out. Um, typically that 112 and 110 it will drop significantly uh, before before the session is ended. So as I mentioned back in, uh, I don't know, Nancy, was it January, I guess, when we were here? Uh, I had five bills introduced. So the House, we limit ourselves to five bills that can be introduced. The Senate, I think this session was 10. Uh, so I, I did have five bills introduced of two of those uh, have passed the House. Uh, House Bill 1401 uh, started as a DNR, so I'm, I'm I'm Shane Lindauer. Did I say who I was? I'm Shane Lindauer. I'm state representative on, of District 63, uh, which is portions of Dubois, Davies, Pike, and Martin County. So I apologize for uh, not, not leading with that. Um, and I'm, I'm chair of, of uh, House Natural Resources. I'm also on environmental committee uh, in the House as well. So uh, with that, I had House Bill 1401, which started as the DNR agency bill. So typically in, in a given year, all the agencies in the state will have an agency bill um, it could be big things, it could be small things. Um, this year, DNR's agency bill, and those, those bills typically go to the chair of their respective committees. Um, it started as a pretty small bill, uh, but there was a, uh, the last few years, a water a drainage task force that had been meeting, um, and, a, and a lot came out of that. So uh, because I had control of the bill, I was able to stick a fair amount of stuff in there that uh, wasn't in the underlying bill. Uh, I think kind of pro-property rights issues. I know, I, I think I said last time, one of the biggest issues I've heard on a consistent basis since I've been state representative is kind of the constant battle between, you know, property rights, and, and specifically in our area, it's typically farmers, and, and uh, the agencies, DNR in particular, sometimes IDEM. And we understand there's a constant balance between property rights and how those property rights impact folks that are upstream, downstream, next door, whatever it may be. So uh, we're, we're, we're you know, always looking to try to find a way to, to strike those uh, that, that proper balance. So House Bill 1401 uh, gave a few, uh, or eased some restrictions, again, mostly on farmers, with stream crossings, um, uh, with being able to build, for instance, DNR wouldn't allow farmers to uh, repair or put in a farm fence if it was in a floodplain. Uh, they wouldn't let a farmer cross a stream um, if it was in a floodplain without, now I say that caveat, you had to go through and get permits and things like that, right? So what we've done in 1401 is allow those things to happen without a permit. Still certain conditions have to be met, right? So you're not 
you're not uh, you know crossing the Potoka River or White River or something like that without DNR permission. But if you've got a, a small ditch or small creek um, that, and you've got a, and, you know, we see this all over the place. You got a field on one side and a field on the other. The ability for a farmer uh, to to just you know, again, certain conditions have to be met as far as drainage. You know, make a make a way to cross that field with the or that ditch with their tractors and equipment without going out and around and, and those kind of things. So, to put a farm fence up, right? We we've allowed that to happen to build accessory structures, um, uh, agricultural structures in floodways and things like that as well. Uh, we actually Indiana was more restrictive than the federal government on that requirement, so we we're able to bring it back down uh, to make us consistent with the federal government on some of that. That's just, just for clarity, that's just for agricultural structures, uh, you know, uh, farm, uh, farm structures and things like that. Not for houses, not for any kind of a boat or anything like that. That's also been a big deal uh, the last few years since I've been in here. So um, several other components in 1401. Uh, I won't go through them all. Happy to answer questions on those uh, when, the, when we get there. I had House Bill 1309 that dealt with uh, PFAS, which is a, a family of, of chemicals, a broad family of chemicals. Um, last year we passed uh, uh, a bill that s sought to protect firefighters. So we've all heard of, uh, well maybe we're not, we haven't, I hadn't heard of it until a year or so ago, but PFOA and PFOS, which are cancer causing, they have a detrimental health impacts. So last year we passed a bill that uh, made a, a required labeling and things like that for firefighters, firefighter foam, their turnout gear and things like that. Um, frankly, uh, those things have a, um, they're, they're good at what they do as far as preventing fires and things like that. So there hasn't been a real good alternative for some of those things. And so it's kind of that with, with some of those chemicals, the good outweighs the bad. Um, but we at least wanted people to know, volunteer firefighters in particular, what they're dealing with. Uh, so we had a bill last year that did that. But on the flip side, there's a broad range of chemistry. So it's not, if you hear PFAS, there's not one chemistry. The chemistries are very broad, thousands of different chemistries. Uh, some of these chemistries are in inhalers, they're in pacemakers, and, and things like that. So the bill was trying to kind of separate those, uh, those different chemistries out. Uh, it passed the House, it got held up in the Senate. Um, House Bill 1397 was a bill that I had uh, that was trying to seek a balance between the legislative branch and the executive, or and the executive branch. Uh, that bill didn't get a hearing, but uh, there's a Senate bill, Senate Bill 234, that I'm co-sponsor on that came over from the Senate. It passed the Senate. I think it's got a really good shot in the House that, uh, that again, tries to strike that balance. So this specifically came up during COVID where um, I was hearing from a lot of constituents. I know other legislators were hearing from a lot of constituents where we had no input on what was happening uh, during the COVID, during a state of emergency, and we could not call ourselves back into session. So the way things are, are written, um, only the governor can call us back in. So basically what this bill does, is says, uh, it says, it doesn't change that. That's also, there's a constitutional provision that allows, the, that, that mandates that as well. However, in Title 10 of Indiana Code, there's a provision in there that if we tweak this, was what this bill's doing, um, that, that says the governor, he or she, um, can, can only do up to 60 days on a state of emergency, and then he or she has to call us back in to either approve or, or deny that. So uh, that's Senate Bill 234 that I'm co-sponsor on as it's come over. Uh, that's very similar to my 1397 uh, that, that, like I said, I think it's going to move. I also had House Bill 1398, uh, which had a lot of deregulation. I, th I said last time as well, that was a meeting that we had here. Uh, I think it was back in June or July. I know some of you in the room were, were at that meeting. It came with um, uh, child care providers, and we've all heard the struggles that child care providers are having um, as far as, and, and what we heard in that meeting was a lot of regulatory hurdles. And so I had a bill, uh, 1398, that was largely deregulatory uh, in scope. Didn't get a hearing, but there's a, a similar House bill, House Bill 1102, which passed the House, passed the Senate. There's some changes in there, so we're still kind of, negotiating on exactly what that bill is going to look like, but that does have some deregulatory uh, aspects to it. Uh, it'll, it'll increase the number of, of children that can be in a home by, by two. We're not talking massive amounts of increase here, frankly. It's, it's little movement on this. Um, it adds, if, you know, if, if a relative is a provider, it, it adds a little bit of flexibility and freedom there. Uh, and there's a few other aspects of that bill that, that are uh, being worked on in, in the process. So that bill is going to move. Uh, I was able to sponsor, so if you're if you introduce the bill in the House, you're the author, and when it when it goes over to the Senate side, I have to find a sponsor. They're the same way. So 
Uh, on the Senate side, I, I had two bills uh, that, that came over to the House that I was the sponsor. I was the lead sponsor on uh, House Bill, or I'm sorry, Senate Bill 241 um, caused uh, DNR to implement a bobcat hunting season. And you'd be surprised. I don't know if any of you are in here interested in that, but how many times I've heard about from uh, hunters, trappers, uh, outdoor enthusiasts on the need for a bobcat hunting season. Um, and so that is, that is something that uh, will cause DNR to study uh, well, frankly, DNR has been studying this for quite some time. It's, it's not that they have no grasp on what's going on uh, with, with bobcats. There's no doubt that the population has uh, dramatically increased. And, and so this, this bill, Senate Bill 241, causes them to, to study the issue more thoroughly and then implement a season. It's silent. The bill itself is silent on quotas and, and tag limits and, and, and things like that. But it, it, so theoretically, DNR could, could look at this and say, okay, we need, a, we need a hunting season in these southern Indiana counties and nothing in Hamilton County, Marion County, which frankly is probably um, not unreasonable, right? We're not seeing a lot of bobcats in Marion County when, when I'm in Indianapolis or certainly Hamilton County and some of the donut counties. But I, I hear from a surprising amount of people in our neck of the woods here, the counties in southern Indiana, about the bobcats. The concern is um, they are uh, you know, harming the, the small game populations, rabbits, uh, quail um, and, and squirrels, things like that. So the, the DNR will study that and, and kind of see where it goes. <clears throat> so that's Senate Bill 241. I also uh, sponsored Senator, one of Senator Messmer's bills. It was Senate Bill 281 um, a few years ago, two, 2017. I w it was before I was in the legislature. Um, I came in, I was caucused in after the, uh, the session, but uh, it required anyone under 18 to wear a helmet on an ATV or UTV. Um, what this bill does, well, I, I would say an unattended consequence of that is a lot of, uh, you, you've all seen the side-by-side, -side, side by side four-wheelers, right? The utility vehicles that have the cages, the doors, the, you know, the whole nine yards. Some of them got windshield wipers and power steering for goodness sakes. And a lot of, a lot of parents are putting car seats in those. Well, the way the letter of the law is written, you still have to have a helmet on the kid in the car seat. Well, if you've ever tried to do that, you understand it's very difficult to do, to put a helmet on a, car, on a kid in a car seat. And so parents were foregoing the helmets, and uh, well, there's Senator Messmer there. Uh, he reports there were uh, 100, over 100, I think it was, that we're talking about your Senate bill, uh, Senator Messmer, 281 on the, the helmets. Um, over 100 or more, I think, was a senator that, uh, that had been ticketed for uh, not having a helmet on. So all we're doing is striking the requirement that if you've got a car seat and it's properly secured, you don't have to have a helmet for a kid in a car seat. So uh, that one I, I've heard a little bit about. I just I, I wanted to mention it because I thought there was some misunderstanding on exactly what happened in that bill. So um, also Senate Bill 49 that came over uh, from the Senate. Um, we heard that, I heard that in Natural Resources Committee. Um, it deals with catastrophically disabled veterans. And what it does is, and catastrophically disabled veterans is defined in Department of Defense, Department of Defense in their code, right, at the federal level. And it's um, catastrophic is has got a, a very set level of criteria that have to be met. But at the state level, we provided for a, a free hunting day for them, the same day that youth hunters also participate. Obviously, if you're... Um, you know, a, a disabled veteran, you've got, uh, you know, they're, they're, they we're talking amputees, we're talking folks with PTSD and, and things like that. So uh, providing them a day that they can get out into the woods that's, uh, you know, things are a little more subdued, they've got to have a guide with them. Uh, and, and, it, and it's a free hunting day as well for, for those folks. So that was a bill that we heard um, uh, this, this, the second half of session in Natural Resources Committee. And then uh, Senate Bill 256, I wanted to mention this when I see some familiar faces in here, um, dealing with the attendant care program, uh, structured family care. Um, this is something that stemmed out of what FSSA did. Uh, and again, for those of you who were here last time, there's whatever reason, we're trying to get to the bottom of this yet. Uh, FSSA grossly underestimated their, uh, their budget and it was a billion or so dollar yeah, a shortfall in their in their funds, and that was going to kick a, a lot of families uh, with, uh, with with children with significant disabilities out of the system. Uh, so I know myself and several legislators I know on the Senate side as well have been trying to get answers from FSSA. Uh, I can't say that 
I've gotten satisfactory answers as yet. We uh, we had a, there were about 20 of us that had a meeting with FSSA two weeks ago, and I, I feel like I left the meeting maybe as confused as when I got there. Uh, but but all that to say, yesterday in Senate Bill 256, um, we were able to get some I think beneficial aspects amended in, and I want to just very clearly caution that this is still early in the process. This there's there's things going to be negotiated here, uh, so don't. Don't take this a run with it just yet, um, but but there are uh, some some aspects in that in the bill now as amended yesterday uh, that will mandate the pass through from the uh, from the care organizations to the actual caregiver. Uh, so we've heard stories in the past about uh, you know families or the caregiver getting. 30% of the money coming from SSA, FSSA or 40% of the money and then the provider keeping the rest. Uh, what this does is actually kind of flips that on its head. It, it mandates the more of the money from FSSA pass through to the caregiver. Um, and again, what that number is right now is amended as 80% coming through the caregiver. Now that, that um, I think is subject to change, just fair warning on that. I don't know that it's gonna stay at 80%. Uh, it also created a new tier, so families that go from the attendant care to the structured family care, which is what I think a lot of families who have parents caring for the children are, are going to want to do at, after this all goes, goes through and shakes out. Uh, currently, there's a three-tiered system in the structured family care, and what we amended in yesterday added a fourth tier in that, and of course, the, it's a fourth tier, a more significant, more acute children um, and so the money for that obviously would 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 increase as well um, and then there's also several amendments that went in that dealt with as I started with in this discussion trying to get to what happened wh you know why this happened how this was missed so badly uh, reporting going forward to keep this from happening going forward and again <clears throat> not all that's probably going to stay in there there's there's going to be a lot of negotiation that happens going forward uh, but but there were some significant uh, amendments to it yesterday and and uh, to Senate Bill 256. So that's one you can watch if for those of you uh, that are that are tracking uh, this uh, this issue. So trying to get to the bottom of, of that. So with that, that's what I've got. I'll turn it over to Senator Mesmer and let him share. Perfect. I was looking through Shane's notes to make sure that some of my head I won't repeat. So he's already covered. And and on Senate Bill 281, there were about 175 families who had kids in a car seat properly restrained in a UTV, not, not, not a four-wheeler, and like a side-by-side. -side. They have to have roll bars, you know, roll bar protection. Um, kid has to be properly restrained. It, it either has to have lap belts or shoulder belts that you can, you know, safely uh, fasten the, you know, the car seat into the, into the UTV. Um, some other bills that I was working on, one's uh, down to the final house passage on Monday, Senate Bill 222. Uh, it's the annual Secretary of State Auto Dealer Bill. Um, it deals with some stop sale language. So currently, if you if you sell used cars in the state, and a manufacturer puts out a stop sale notice uh, that you know that you know because of recall, uh, there's a provision in there that that the manufacturer has to reimburse the you know the dealer uh, one percent of their financing you know fees per month, uh, but it doesn't apply to new cars. New cars have to go through federal court. To get uh, to get if there's a, a dispute or there's a federal law, you know that same language, one percent of their of their financing cost, but your only remedy is to go to federal court in 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 the state that the manufacturer resides in. So you might have to go to Michigan, uh, you might have to go to Georgia. Um, it just depends on where the you know where that stop sale came from. And Senate Bill 222 gives all car dealers remedy for that in state court. And and it, for the first place it sets up is whether it's new or used. It gives them the ability to appeal to the Secretary of State's office. There's an internal uh, ALJ, you know, uh, process that doesn't cost much for them to do. Um, and there was a dealer in Fort Wayne that had about a half a million dollars tied up in stop sale costs uh, from, you know, I think it was from Stellantis uh, that that hadn't, you know, hadn't paid them for um, almost a year on some stop sale. Uh, payments and 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 even on small dealers that we had examples of you know fifty thousand dollars tied up in stop sale you know financing costs some are twenty five but if you're a small dealer you can't afford to go to another state and pay out of state attorney's fees in a federal court so uh, that one looks like it's on the finish line 
Um, a bill that I co-authored this year uh, was given the uh, Attorney General the ability to enforce the sanctuary city ordinances or sanctuary university ordinances. Uh, we had when we pa passed that bill at a couple different levels over the last you know 10, 15 years, a couple different versions of that. But the enforcement we had was allow you know any person to you know to you know to have standing to bring that to court to stop a, a sanctuary city or university. Um, and the Supreme Court said that's too broad. Uh, you know, you, um, you've got to have a, a more specific remedy to that. So the, the Attorney General has the ability to, to defend any of our state laws in court. And so we put that uh, enforcement ability to the AG's office. Um, to do, do the DNR Bobcat rule, I, I ended up being a co-author on that. And anybody who likes to hunt, you've seen Bobcats, you know, messing up turkey populations and small game populations and even impact deer populations somewhat so uh, and it's not a statewide problem I mean there's areas in the state where you know the bobcats but it, it, it just has DNR you know set the rulemaking process up um, we don't we didn't tell them how to do it it's going to follow their normal hearings their normal biologist um, you know evaluation of of you know bobcat populations another bill that I co-authored was uh, Senate Bill 5 and it deals with uh, lead line uh, replacements on, on water services to homes. Uh, there's still a couple hundred thousand you know, households in Indiana that have lead line service lines. And this makes it, uh, streamlines the process, makes it less complicated for utilities and, uh, you know, to, to get, get, get the replacements done, incentivizes them to, you know, to work with customers to get those lead service lines out of homes. Um, and, do oh uh, one of the bills that I house bills that I sponsored was House Bill 1123, and worked with Tammy Lampert with the local uh, SWICAC, the Community Action uh, Coalition here in Dubois County. Uh, it it sets up multidisciplinary teams when kids are uh, in their system through you know dealing with child abuse that that involves prosecutors, the the community action centers, uh, DCS, law enforcement, and and gets better. Uh, better communication between those multidisciplinary teams on how to deliver services, you know, to kids in the system, and keeps kids from, you know, potentially being re-entered back into a dangerous environment, you know, with better communication, uh, you know, between that multidisciplinary team. So that passed unanimously in the House and the Senate, <clears throat> and and just honored to be a part of that. Um, I think it was all uh, we had a we had a bill that went through the first half of session, both both ha House and Senate was. House Bill 1383, and, and it was a it was a bill that uh, the Indiana Department of Environmental Management asked for. Uh, we had passed a bill dealing with isolated wetlands three years ago, and it and it set up more clarity and definition so they could they could uh, enforce the the law the way it was intended to be uh, set up. and And it was really their language that they brought to General Assembly. Uh, we passed it through both both bodies in the first half of session, and pretty sure the governor signed that and and uh, in in place. So. Um, with that, it's been a pretty good session. Uh, a bill that we did on on uh, third reading this week that came back from the House with some changes was Senate Bill One, and it uh, it requires you know teaching uh, of of uh, teaching of reading uh, using basically phonics. It goes back to what most of us had when we were in school. Uh, it sets up a lot of it sets up a process that if a kid and they start the reading evaluations for kids earlier, they start them earlier in the process, so by the time they get out of third grade, they've had uh, enhanced uh, training on reading, you know, more specialized uh, remediation work. And uh, there was, there's plenty of op you know, options out. If a kid's been held back once already when they get to third grade, if they have a, a, a uh, English as a, as a, not their primary language, if they're a special ed student, uh, there's, you know, there's a lot of place, a lot of room for flexibility, so you don't, you know, trap a kid in third grade forever. That would be that would not be beneficial. And if they've already passed the uh, the math courses, but still need some remedi still need some remediation, they can be moved on. So, uh, some very reasonable amendments to that in the in the house and uh, passed that this week. And uh, glad to see that one uh, in place because the, over the last 20 years, our reading scores have consistently dropped, and we've got to do something to get the the ship turned around. Okay, I'm just going to um, start with the first one. Senate Bill 1, what data shows retention in third grade is beneficial? 
What increased monies will be directed to this effort? And are the reading expectations being pushed too high too soon? Well, if a kid can't read at the end of the third grade, you learn to read in grades one through three, and then from then on you read to learn, and you've got to be able to read. And, and um, obviously retention is the last course. That's why there's a lot of other steps in the process. Um, it's not a budget year, so we don't have additional monies you know, in Senate Bill 1. I'm sure if there is adi additional monies, in it, I mean, we spent a lot of money in past budgets, a ton of money, hundreds of millions of dollars in, in, in extra reading uh, funding. And uh, I would say that, that that is not an expectation being pushed too high by any means. Yeah, there was, <clears throat> I would just add considerable, I'm sure in the Senate there's considerable debate in the House as well. And it, it's, uh, it, Obviously, a, a difficult issue uh, to to uh, retain a kid. It's a, it's a serious issue, issue. But we also heard a lot of stories of, uh, you know, kids kids getting into middle school and, and high school and not being able to read, which also I would say is is a more difficult issue. So, um, it, it, it's I feel like this is a a step in the right direction as, as far as uh, trying to increase our our reading uh, levels in, in the state. So. Okay, there are a couple questions concerning House Bill 1304. I'm just going to read them all, and then you can address them. So House Bill 1304, Mastery-Based Education Program, what is it, and why is it tied to collective bargaining? House Bill 1304 for Mark Messmer. This bill creates a new mastery-based education program. While the majority of the bill sounds good, there is a small part that allows a school corporation to opt out of bargaining salary and benefits with the teachers that are employed within this program. In committee, an amendment was proposed to strike this language and failed. If an amendment is proposed on the floor of the Senate that strikes this language, would you support the amendment? Would you put forth an amendment to strike this language? If not, change occurs. If no change occurs, would you vote against this bill? Please explain your reasoning so we can understand. And then um, for House members, this bill, 1304, passed the House with overwhelming support. Can you explain the reasoning for allowing school corporations to opt out of the negotiation process for the certified staff in this mastery program. Teachers have already lost their rights to bargain working conditions. Allowing opt-outs will continue to chip away those rights. And then another one on 1304, why is there a continued push to devalue the rights of educators serving the most vulnerable in the state? What is your stance on teachers' rights to collective bargaining? That's a lot of questions on a bill that's on second reading on money, and I haven't read it until I get out of committee. Uh, I uh, maybe Shane can shed a little bit of light on on the bill. But if it hasn't if it hasn't gotten out of committee, I don't read any bills until they get out of committee. I'm not on the education committee, so there's a ton of questions that I don't have a lot of background on. Yeah, I, I I'm just reading through the question here. I, I don't know that there's a an effort to push or, or to value the rights of educators uh, serving the most vulnerable. Um, I would argue with that. I, I think that we've what we've tried to do at the state is uh, provide uh, alternative. You know, we, we hear about educator shortage, but it, I would I would argue it's not just an educator shortage. There's a shortage in everywhere. Um, I'm a small business owner, and I have regularly have difficulty finding employees. So this isn't just a um, a teacher shortage. It's a, it's a workforce shortage at the moment. So, um, uh, and what we've tried to do at the state is, is provide um, uh, licensing. So if you've got a, uh, if you're an expert in chemistry or something like that, to, to slide into a teaching role. And, and I know that's, uh, I, I'm not sure if that's where the, the, uh, the, the nature or the, or the tenor of the question is coming from. But uh, like I said, there's, there's not a, there's not a, an, an, an an advocacy or, or a big push at the state level to devalue rights of educators at all. Um, I've, I talk to educators regularly. I'll extend that invitation to anyone in the room. 
I've, I've talked with many teachers. Um, unfortunately, um, I've, I've had teachers tell me that they won't talk to me without their union rep. Um, and I've, had, I've shown up to teachers' meetings and uh, been blindsided with a union rep that shows up. And that, that ends up being a discussion between me and the ISTA union rep instead of a discussion between me and the teacher. So um, I'm happy to talk to teachers. Um, I've never, nor have I heard of anyone trying to devalue um, the, the voice of, of educators. So happy to talk to them. I mean, I'm just reading through the, the the digest of the bill, and I mean, I, I don't really see any of that in the digest. Yeah, I mean, provides for the availability of certain grants for literacy coaches, establishes a mastery-based education program administered by the Department of Education. Um, I can't answer that specific question. I mean, I'm happy to come up afterwards I'm happy to try to get that answer for you and, and um, obviously it's a it's a you know it's a 37 page bill I, like Mark I'm not on the education committee either so I wasn't part of those in-depth discussions uh, but I'm happy to try to, to find an answer and, and get to this the, the nature you know specific nature here so and it looks like it passed the house 98 to nothing right. and it, it could have got amended in the Senate uh, since it left the house but we haven't talked about it in caucus. We, I'm not on the education committee. I'd be happy to look in your questions and talk to you in more detail when when the meeting's over. Yeah, and again, as Senator Messerman makes, I mean, if it passed 98 to nothing, it had obviously broad support from all stakeholders, or pretty much pretty much all stakeholders. So I, I, uh, but again, happy to answer any questions. I mean, that's uh, there's 100 of us in the Senate. My my guess, and, and nobody voted against. It. I'm sorry, in the, in the House, and nobody voted against it. That's Republican and Democrat. So. Okay, so those educators that are here, if you want to come down afterwards, um, they mentioned they were happy to talk to you about some of those issues. Uh, House Bill 1001, Career Scholarship Accounts. First year, $5 million. Second year, $10 million. What is the data on utilization? Again, I'm not on the I'm not on the uh, education committee, so I, I can't I, I can't tell you what the data is on that committee. So the way it works, uh, typically the committees will do uh, a deep dive into the data. There's people from the ISTA, from every every uh, stakeholder that has anything to do with education will come to those meetings and participate in the uh, the committee meetings. And and so when they come out of committee, typically we don't get as, as a non-member of, of that committee, the deep dive into uh, the deep dive into the, the the nature of the bill, all the background of those bills, uh, as far as what was presented data-wise and, and 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 everything. So uh, we we look through uh, when it when it comes over to the house, look through uh, the 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 notes on on how uh, this is how I do it anyway. I don't want to speak for Senator Mesmer. Uh, how it came out of committee. Um, there's there's notes on who testified in favor, who testified against, um, and, and you can tell a lot by to, who typically testified you know, in favor or, or opposed, why they opposed, why they were in favor of it. But as far as the specific data, I'm, I'm not going to be able to give you the, the specific data on that. So I apologize for that. I think unless you're on the committee, you, you, you don't hear the data, data presented unless you're on the committee that any bill's being, being worked on. When the bill gets to the floor, it, it's basically, you, you know, you, you read the digest of the bill, you, you have the testimony from the author or the sponsor, uh, and sometimes, you know, data questions come up in questioning, but not, you know, not very often. Okay, we'll move on to another question. House Bill 1120 deals with the growth quotient, qu the growth quotient, <laughs> quotient <laughs> extending for another year. Why would we extend it when municipalities were directed previously to grow to make up for tax caps that were implemented? I wish the service here was a little quicker. Is that 
Is that password key? Um, so it said, said it increases the value of the pro disabled pro veteran property tax deduction from two hundred to two hundred forty thousand. Um, which others? Pardon, what's the question? Um, I think you know, if they just extended the growth quotient for another year, it's because next year is a budget year, and 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 you know pushing the you know property tax assessment, you know, problems, uh, you know, into a budget, you know, we can deal with it. Yeah, I, I know that, you know, obviously that the property tax issue has been a big issue. Um, and last year, and I forget the name of the house bill we, we worked on where we, we did try to, we tried to limit that. And maybe that's what the, the questions, questions getting to here. It, it's obviously going to be an issue that we have to work on again. And the in the coming session um, to, to make sure we get that right. Uh, you know, when we, it, it sounds good to, at the state level to cap property taxes, uh, but then that takes away, or may sound good, um, unless you're, uh, you know, on a school board or city council or county council or something like that, when uh, those property taxes are going to those, those local units. Um, and, and so uh, there's, you know, repercussions and ramifications for all that stuff. Um, so again, exactly why that was extended, I, I can't answer. Uh, but whoever, again, whoever wrote the question, I'm, I'm happy to, to, you know, get a better feel for what, where you're coming from and, and get you a better answer. And I, I know I'll, I'll get back with you. I know Senator Messmer will as well. So. Okay. Representative Lindauer, you authored a partisan bill, House Bill 1399, along with Senator Messmer, PFAS, you mentioned that earlier, are forever chemicals that are toxic and dangerous to our health. While the bill did not get a hearing, can you explain your rationale for introducing this bill? I, yeah, I kind of talked about this at the beginning. I mean, the rationale was, um, again, I think the, with all due respect, the, the tenor of the question misunderstands the issue. Uh, they're, they're not the same chemical. Uh, this isn't like lead. I heard, I've heard people say it's, it's like lead or, or uh, a radon. It's not. Lead and radon are lead and radon. They're individual elements. Uh, PFAS are, again, a broad range of chemicals, thousands of different chemistries that, that with different properties and, 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 and different ways that they interact. They, they biodegrade differently. They break down differently. They bioaccumulate differently. Um, and so what's happened, uh, well, let me back up. The federal government, the Biden administration, the EPA, recognizes that there's different chemistries. They've got different definitions. There's like three different definitions in the EPA alone on what PFAS is. Uh, the DOD has got a different definition of what PFAS is. So pretty much everybody recognizes that there's different chemistries within the world of PFAS. Um, some states, uh, Minnesota, Maine, have moved to regulate uh, in a significant way PFAS and make it um, illegal or highly regulated. Well, the problem with that is uh, some of these, as I indicated earlier, are used in inhalers uh, that are used in... Uh, pacemakers that are used in touch screens that are used in batteries um, got a whole whole list of a whole list of things fluid seals uh, defibrillators these P PFAS chemistries are used in those as well and so when states like Minnesota and Maine have gone to limit these they quickly found out that that was not a great idea so Maine the author of the bill in Maine uh, has, has been on record as saying that that has to be um, reworked essentially uh, the Minnesota bill, they've, they've reworked and reworked and reworked what's going on in Minnesota. So what this was, was using science to look at the chemistries that, again, have, have not, the, the, the things we were looking for in there, if I could find it in my notes here, they're water soluble, uh, they, they bioaccumulate in compounds that, to, that could degrade into chemicals of concern. So if it's any of those chemistries, they're still able to be regulated. They're still able to be looked at, studied, and, and regulated however we want to do that as a state. And currently, it's important to note, we're not doing any of this in the state of Indiana. The only thing we did in last year's bill was, was say that uh, there's labeling requirements that went on there. So um, again, it's, it's a, it's, I would say it's just a, it's a broad range of chemistries. We're trying to provide some regulatory certainty for our industry. Industry is a, a, or Indiana is a heavy manufacturing state, obviously. Um, and we've got a lot of, of uh, 
uh, uh, industry looking to come to Indiana. And so what we were doing, you know, using science and looking at what is known about these broad range of chemicals and, and trying to provide a safe pathway for, for use on those chemicals. So, I mean, I think if there were any chemicals that, that, that are used in, in products that, that touch your skin, just, just like the firefighter turnout gear that they had last year, that they, they did put some protections in and notification, you know, in for firefighters and, and policies to help, you know, protect their health. When there, there is no substitute for, for PFAS chemicals and, and most of the things that they're used for. Uh, they're used in, in pharmaceuticals. I mean, there's a broad range. But if they do bioaccumulate in your body, we want to have make, we want to make sure IDEM had the, the ability to regulate that. Today they do they, they do nothing, uh, and and it was basically setting definitions up for the things we know to be dangerous, and there are some you know could there be a, a PFAS in the plastics in this? Yeah, there is, in in everything you touch, everything you do every day. There's PFAS plastic chemicals, in almost every every component of life, and. You know, if but if there's no danger to the person, you know, using the product and the way it's being used, you know, why why set up, and you know, why set up you know rules and regulations around that, you know, if it ended if, if at any time any any PFAS product, you know, became known to be a, a health hazard, you know, IDEM would immediately have you know regulatory authority over that. Just to follow up on that, so um, there are 28. PFAS compounds listed under the EPA's unregulated containment monitoring uh, rule. There's 180 uh, PFAS compounds listed in, under the EPA's toxic release inventory. Um, there's also a, a, a broad list of PFAS under the EPA's uh, monitoring of drinking water. All those are still allowed to be to, to be monitored and, and regulated in Indiana. The, 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 the bill that we worked on uh, was was very narrow, uh, and again, it, it focused on on chemistries that that, that are water soluble, uh, that that bioaccumulate, or that that could degrade into chemicals that, that are that are chemicals of concerns or chemistries of concern. So, um, again, it's 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 and it's not unheard of. Um, uh, Delaware has a very similar uh, very similar language. I think uh, we our definition was a little more strict, uh, and and so did West Virginia as well. So. But happy to talk to whoever wrote that question as well, if you want more detail. All right, thank you. <clears throat> Two uh, questions concerning uh, veterans. Uh, what veterans benefits did the General Assembly pass in the 2023 session? And then what legislative items concerning veterans has the General Assembly considered in the 2024 session? Well, not being a budget year, there wouldn't have been any veteran benefits bills this session. Um, I didn't bring my 2023 notes, but there's never a session goes by that we don't deal deal with some type of you know veterans benefit legislation. Um, um, I could I could uh, whoever wrote that question, if it's one of you guys, I mean, I could give you a, a connection to all of the veterans resources that we've done in the past you know past 10 years. We've got a pretty co comprehensive list on our Senate website of veterans benefits, but uh, there wouldn't have, wouldn't have been any this session since it's not a budget year. Right, I, I did mention the uh, catastrophically disabled veterans bill. That was that was probably the most notable this year. But as Senator Messmer indicated, um, non-budget year probably not a lot going to happen. Was was not going to happen this session as far as uh, doing those things. Now we ha we had done some you know bills in the past. Uh, the 2023 session. I'm trying to pull up the numbers. I don't I don't recall the numbers, but uh, 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 making pensions tax-free and things like that. Uh, that and again, I don't my, my slow service. I can't get, I can't get the the numbers pulled up here. But I'm happy to talk through those again with you too, if if uh, gentlemen want to come up and 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 talk with us. So. Okay, uh, switching gears here. Have there been any recent tries to legalize marijuana? Would you oppose or support such a measure? And what is your reasoning for that? And then um, kind of a statement question. Medical studies have shown that the brain isn't fully developed until age 25, and drinking alcohol has negative effects on brain development. If there was a proposal to increase the alcohol age limit to 25, would you support or oppose that? Why or why not? So two questions, one on marijuana and one on alcohol. So I guess starting with the marijuana, um, 
yeah, there's tries every session, I think, to legalize it. Um, I think there's bills. I, my, I don't have the bills in front of me right now. Uh, again, service is, is not cooperating here, but uh, I, I'm, I'm sure there were bills to legalize. I've co-authored, I, I think Senator Messmer has as well, co-authored bills for medical marijuana. And I know some of you, I've had discussions with some of you in the room who are, who are uh, violently opposed, not, maybe that's too strong of a word, but, but very opposed to that as well. Um, so I, I've, I'm still in favor of medical marijuana. Um, I think when you look at the, uh, a lot of the prescription drugs that are out there right now, uh, medical marijuana, I think, would be a better alternative than, than some of the prescription drugs that are, that are on the market right now. And, and so I, I think that's a reasonable step to take. Um, I have, um, I've been resistant or hesitant on recreational marijuana. I'm, I'm interested in looking at what other states like Colorado, we get very mixed, uh, very mixed stories on, on what's happening in Colorado. Oregon, I know, uh, was, was a state that's, you know, fully implemented. Uh, well, I, I don't want to go too far. I don't know if they fully implemented, but, but bought into the legalization of, of many narcotics. And I think now they are starting to pull back on, on a lot of that stuff from what I understand. So um, I have not gone so far as to support uh, medical uh, marijuana. Uh, I'm sorry, um, uh, recreational marijuana yet. So uh, the alcohol thing, I have I, uh, not given that a whole lot of thought. Moving the age till 25, I would just say off the cuff here, which is probably never a good idea. Uh, no, I wouldn't support that. Um, you know, there's... Uh, you know, I know it probably sounds cliche at this point, but you've got, uh, you know, young young men and, and some some young women fighting in the military at 18. I I, uh, I I just I can't see limiting that at this point. But again, I I uh, I'm I'm willing to look at some studies, but that would be one I would probably just at the outset would be against. So, um, and I, I would agree with Shane. I mean. There are some valid medical uses for marijuana. We, we've had study committees on it. Um, I think there's pr pretty broad support. You know, if the if the there there hasn't been a really good state, you know, to follow on on how they set up medical marijuana, um, <clears throat> and def and, and and full recreational marijuana. You know, the, the states that have passed recreational uh, marijuana use. Uh, they end up just shifting where the enforcement goes because you end up setting up a black market for people that don't want to pay the taxes in the marijuana industry. So they, they never meet their income projections that they're, that they're guaranteed or promised because it ends up law enforcement, instead of tracking down people who have marijuana, they're tracking down people that are selling out you know, in the black market. And it, it just shifts where the law enforcement has to focus their efforts. Um, I'm not sure that, I mean, if there was, Good statistical, you know, data to you know to make the push to, to 25 on alcohol sales. You know, I, I'm sure you know it'd be something if there's data to back it up. You know, we could look at it, but I could say that that would be a pretty tough push to get through. You know, uh, the General Assembly uh, just it wasn't. It's probably within our lifetime that they moved it from 18 to 21. Uh, but you know, and and valid reasons to do that. But you know, and, and obviously the the Later in life, you know, people start to consume alcohol or take it, you know, or use drugs of any kind. The, the, the longer you postpone people being introduced to it, the less likely they're going to they're going to deal with addiction issues. So, um, I would say that would be a, a hard one to get, you know, get past. But if there's data to support it, you know, would we'll definitely start having the the talk in the health committees and public policy committees. Okay, this is for both of you. The partisan bill, House Bill 1383, again eliminates more Indiana wetlands in favor of developers. This not only has a negative impact on Indiana, but also on surrounding states and the Great Lakes. Can you both share the rationale behind passing this bill? Again, House Bill 1383. Yeah, I think I touched on it already. House Bill 1383 just gave IDEM the definition clarification they needed on what was a class one what's a class two and what's a class three. You'd be surprised how many of you probably have a class one wetland in your yard. And, and, and the definitions that IDEM asked for were, what, as, as we worked on the Senate Bill 389, I believe three years ago, you know, we, we tried to work with IDEM to set up definitions and, and, and de define what a class one, two, and three were. Um, and, and most states don't have any isolated wetlands laws at all. Most state, very few states even regulate 
isolated wetlands. I, I, what you see is a duck pond or a goose pond in a nature preserve. That is not an isolated wetland. An isolated wetland is a, pla is a, is a place that doesn't dry out necessarily quickly. But it could be for multiple reasons. And, and you know, class one wetlands, uh, you know, could, could be a, you know, could be pretty broadly, you know, pulled into, you know, a wet spot in your yard, you know, quite easily would, would classify as a, as a class one wetland. And, and IDEM wanted definitions that clearly defined what a class one, two, and three wetland were so they could put the regulations, uh, you know, enforce the regulations in, that we passed three years ago on, on Senate Bill 389. Yeah, this goes back to I think how I, I started the, the the session today was you know the the constant balance between property rights and the impact on on those around us. But uh, back to Senator Mesmer's part, you know, or, or, or comments when, when we worked on this bill what was it, 283, 83, whatever it was, a, a Senate bill a few years ago. Um, I was part of that on the House side as it came over to the House side and had had stories and again, typically farmers, but. Um, more than one instance where a farmer had to uh, a, a low spot in his field that became a a wetland at this point and instead of being able to uh, to cultivate and plant that field it was a, a, a you know a section maybe a, a 100 feet by 100 feet in the middle of this guy's you know several hundred acre field that, that he could no longer utilize and it was because it had determined by idem to be a, a a class i think that one was a class one wetland and so we've got a, and what had happened was at one point there was a, uh, I think it was a hog barn there. This is just one instance, right? And so it became kind of the, he called it a, a hog waller, a waller, right? I'm, not, I'm, I'm saying that right, sorry for, uh, for the folks who know how to say waller. Um, but anyway, it was just kind of a low spot there and, and uh, just became identified as a, as a wetland at that point. And so um, I viewed IDEM to be overly aggressive, frankly, in how they classify these wetlands. So the fact that the builders and IDEM came together, worked throughout the summer, there were uh, conservation groups that were part of this, uh, there were environmental consultants that were part of this, uh, that came together and came up with language that was, and again, I, I know it's probably something else that's cliche in, in uh, the political world. If nobody's happy, it's probably about the right spot for the bill to be. And this was one of those situations where Everybody had to give a little bit. Nobody was exactly where they wanted to be. I know the builders wanted it to go farther. Um, and I think IDEM was, was probably uh, not exactly happy where it ended up either. Um, but it, it seems to be, a, a good, again, there's just a constant tension between property rights and, and you know how that impacts those around us. This seemed to be a very reasonable thing to me. So, Yeah, and even, even as we clarified the definitions in House Bill 1383, it allows what is truly a, a biodiverse, you know, class three wetland. It actually increased the remediation uh, requirements, you know, for if you're if you're disrupting. Uh, but you know, the, the still the, the bulk of what IDEM was regulating before the bulk of the acreage was class one wetlands, and it, and it did imp impact farmers. <clears throat> and and even on Senate Bill uh, 389, 289, whatever, um, IDEM supported the bill when we worked on that three years ago. Because they, they, you know, I'll, I'll give an example. Uh, just, just west of the Hardys and Huntingburg, there used to be a little scrub patch, you know, on, on, on those, uh, those properties going west toward the Huntingburg Event Center. And the city of Huntingburg could do nothing with that because that was considered a class two wetland. And, it, and, and in the middle of a city to have a, and, and we put an acreage limit. I don't know what it, what it was a three quarters of an acre that said if it's a if it's a a class you know two or three less than three quarters of an acre in a municipality when you've got all the hardscape in a city you know that that little bit of patch of of scrub you know on that lot and that, on on that little parcel made no sense. And Idem said that makes no sense. So you know we allowed. I mean that that was the kind of things that were you know clarified in that original bill. And then this, you know, this bill just set up the definitions that we thought we all had agreed to, but you know, some of it just wasn't, you know, written clearly enough for them to enforce. All right, we have one last comment. We'll end this on a positive note, and then the legislators are. Um, oh, Ed, you have one yet? <laughs> well, we'll do this positive one first, and then we'll do Ed's. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Um, and this one is from Carla Striegel Winner. She said, I want to thank you for your support of our solid waste management districts in the past and ask you to keep supporting grants that are run through IDEM that benefit the districts. And she is looking forward to her tire grant announcement, hopefully. So it looks like maybe you applied for something and are going to be receiving it and will soon be announcing, Carla. So thank you for the work you do there and for your support on that level. Now here the problem is I can't read Ed's writing. <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm joking. Um, Senator Mesmer, please vote to amend House Bill 1183, Foreign Ownership of Land. Um, second reading amendments are needed to preserve the intentions of the bill and the integrity of Indiana's land from foreign adversaries. This is not an ag bill, but an anti-economic development bill will certain future investment in the state. So I think you know what he's talking about. Maybe you can explain it a little bit. Um, it's on second reading Monday. So if you want to, if there are specific things you'd like to have looked at, I mean, we would have time to, and, and I think, I mean, th that's a tough issue. Um, I mean, in general, um, but if there's specific things you'd like to have looked at in an amendment for that, I'm ha happy to talk and try to get something put together. Yeah, this was a, as Senator Messmer said, it's a, it's a tough issue. As soon as you start doing this, people come out of the woodwork uh, where you're going to negatively impact those folks. And I, I, I'm supportive of the bill. I, I think it's a, it's a, uh, it's, it's an important issue for sure. And it needs something that needs to be looked at, but, but yeah, like Senator Messmer said, I'm happy to, to hear your suggestions or specifically what, what you're referencing there. So. Yeah, I, I, th I think they tried to, to grandfather in existing, you know, businesses. There were some, there were some efforts, but I worked on a bill similar to that two years ago, but I had, you know, I had some, you know, limits on how much land, you know, you know, foreign investment could, could own. And I mean, I think they're striking, you know, a lot of those acreage limits that we put in the bill originally two years ago. Um, but, uh, but we'll talk about details. Happy to try to make that workable. All right. Well, I want to thank everyone for being here this morning. This was a, a lot of questions on a lot of different topics, and I'm glad to see that people in the audience are doing their homework and following the legislative session and things that affect them personally. So uh, thanks to Senator uh, Messmer and to Representative Lindauer for being here this morning. So let's thank them for their time. All right, we will close this down and we'll do this again next year, two or three times in the uh, winter of the year. Thank you. <laughs>